Okay. Hopefully everyone can hear me and everyone can see my screen. Um, uh, Pete's already done a brief introduction of who I am, um, so I won't uh, relive that. Um, I just wanted to say before I get started, uh, thanks a lot to Pete Caristo and AIG for providing the platform for these forums. And thanks for all the panelist members who agreed to join today. I know uh, everyone's time poor these days, um, but really appreciate it. Hopefully we can get some opinions and uh, thoughts going other than my own. So um, what's today's forum all about? Um, really, I just wanted to promote discussions about the continued use of inverse assistance weighting for modeling coal quality parameters. And also I wanted to promote some awareness and promote discussion around uh, the, um, the availability of different techniques that can be used for spatial interpolation. So I'm probably going to say spatial interpolation multiple times throughout this um, little intro. Um, just as a quick refresh, refresher, um, spatial interpolation is just the process of predicting values at unsampled location points using surrounding points or values. And we use spatial interpolation um, for coal resource estimation, so we don't have to drill holes every you know, 10 meters. Um, and there's many, many algorithms that can be used for spatial interpolation. But one of the main algorithms that's quite prevalent in the coal resource industry is inverse distance weighting. Now, um, this is just a really basic refresher. It's one of the most simple um, uh, spatial interpolation um, methods out there. But for people who aren't quite familiar with it, I'm just gonna run through a really quick, simple example of how the algorithm actually works. So we're talking about, and I'm hoping you can see my cursor, um, predicting an unknown point from points with actual values. So these might be um, uh, drill samples, um, say ash values or something like that. So we're interested in this case in predicting this value here where this star is. Um, how inverse distance weighting works is it uses the distances between the known values as weights. And um, then it uses the inverse of those distances in a division sum. So if we just quickly go through this example, we've got values 12, 10, 10. Value 12 is 350 meters from the unknown point. So we take 12 divided by 350, we add 10 divided by 750 and add 10 divided by 850. And that just gets divided by the inverse of those distances. So in this example, this value would be predicted at 11.1. .1. There's variations on inverse distance. And those variations are basically to add a power value to the distances. So in this case, if we squared those distances, we'd get a different result, um, a different predicted value. And in this case, squaring those results just has the effect of um, using, sorry, it has the effect of increasing the weight of closer points. So you can see here, the value 12 is the closest point, 10 and 10 is further away. So that predictive value has increased. So very quick background introduction to inverse distance weighting, very simple um, technique reasonably easy to explain, although I'm probably, <laughs> I probably brutalized the explanation. Anyway, um, aside from inverse distance weighting, there's a whole host of other spatial interpolation techniques. Um, they can be broadly categorized into different groups. I won't go into the meaning of the different groups or whatever, but inverse distance sits in this deterministic group, which is essentially um, a mathematical technique which um, uses the distances alone. Um, there's geostatistical techniques that are available, Kriging and a whole bunch of um, Kriging variants. Uh, machine learning techniques can be used directly for spatial interpolation. And then there's hybrid methods which combine machine learning and usually geostatistics, or they might even combine um, deterministic methods as well. Now, as I said, 
in the coal industry, um, historically, we've tended to use inverse distance, um, but over the past probably 10 years, and also with the introduction of the JORP 2012 code, and then later the um, 2014 black coal guidelines, um, there was a real promotion or advocation for the use of geostatistical methods um, in place of inverse distance. Now we're probably, um, you know, eight to 10 years on from, from the release of those um, uh, documents and also, you know, a whole host of um, academic papers later. And my observation in general um, was that nobody really is utilizing um, geostatistical methods or any other method for that matter to um, spatially interpolate their um, coal quality parameters. Um, so I thought um, to myself that, you know, um, I might uh, do a bit of an academic study on that just to see whether um, my observation, um, my anecdotal evidence uh, was, was true. Um, so what I did is I, uh, I did a quick study. Um, there's a publication about it, um, again, hosted um, by um, AIG uh, Journal. So thanks for that, guys. Um, where I wanted to determine if geostatistical methods were being utilised um, for coal quality property modelling in the coal mining industry at large, um, or if we would continue to rely on um, inverse distance weighting. Um, and because the, there's a requirement um, by the ASX to report results um, against the JORP and black coal guidelines, um, I thought that would be the best place to start. Um, so I used the web scraping algorithm to compile a whole host of JORP reports um, submitted by ASX listed companies over the past five years. And um, to not my surprise, found that inverse distance weighting um, is still the most popular method for modeling coal quality prop properties. Um, I also found that almost all JORP reports failed to give a robust reason for why they were using inverse distance weighting. Uh, there was a lot of um, generalist reasons like uh, it's industry standard or um, it's what was done previously, um, but no real quantitative or robust reasoning for why they used inverse distance, um, despite there being a requirement um, to have a robust reason or have a qualitative reason actually. Um, as part of the study, I also had a look at what surface modelling techniques were used for, for modelling coal surfaces um, and structure, and what, um, what modelling software, if any, was used um, for this spatial interpolation process. Um, here's a really high level summary of um, the results of that paper. Um, if you want more details, again, go to the AIG journal, um, you can download the paper or um, I can send you actually appendix which go even um, into, into greater detail. But what I did is I took um, the largest 45 uh, coal mining companies listed on the ASX, and that's based on uh, market cap. But I found that only 30 of those companies had actually submitted uh, dual reports to the ASX in the last five years. Um, there was, interestingly, uh, some of the largest companies um, did not submit any um, uh, JORC reports to the ASX in that time period, and that may be just a reflection of um, materiality of the resource to their to their overall company. So there's a there's a little caveat to reporting JORC reports um, in, uh, in that uh, you don't have to report them if uh, it's not material to your overall um, company or market cap. So that's perhaps why some of those larger companies aren't reporting those JORC reports. But in any case, uh, 21 of those 30 companies um, used inverse distance for coal quality modelling. Um, one used a finite element method, and eight didn't act, didn't report the method at all. Um, just said they uh, modelled it. Um, this is again despite clear requirements that you need to report what methods you use. Um, for the uh, coal surface modelling, um, there was two standout. Uh, algorithms which were used. Um, again, finite element method, which is a proprietary method, um, part of the Mindscape software um, and triangulation. Again, um, heavily used by uh, Vulcan modeling software. And I think, um, you know, because these were these two software were the pretty much um, 
primarily use software, um, that sort of biases so the use of those methods um, for cold surface modeling. So because there weren't any real reasons uh, or robust reasons listed in any of these dual reports for why they used inverse distance uh, weighting for modeling coal properties. Um, I formed my own opinions. Um, and again, these are my own opinions for why people perhaps are still using inverse distance. Um, and again, this is what this forum is about. If we're not reporting it in dual reports, then maybe we can have a, have a, have a discussion about why we are still using it. Um, these are my ideas again. Uh, maybe it's um, the fact that inverse distance is really simple and easy to explain. Um, so it's used over geostatistical methods, which are perhaps more complex and require a lot more pre-processing steps. One thing I especially think that may hinder the use of um, geostatistical methods in coal is that uh, you need to construct a variogram to use geostatistical methods and interpret those variograms usually by eye, uh, although there are some automated techniques. But when you're trying to model many, many coal quality properties um, and then compounded by many seams or plies, and that can be seen as a bit of a onerous or complex set. Um, another reason might be that people just rely on historic work workflows or results, or perhaps people are um, a bit reluctant to change their methodology if it's going to change the resource estimate. So, um, you know, there might be a bit of company pressure to maintain or increase the resources year on year on. And if changing a methodology actually changes that result, there might be reluctance to use that new method. Um, there might be a lack of uh, expertise or knowledge um, of geostatistical and other methods. Uh, maybe there's limited access to training in um, specialist software that makes use of geostatistical or, or other methods or even these more you know, new and upcoming advanced hybrid machine learning methods. Um, or maybe it is that valid reasons uh, do exist for using inverse distance, um, which, which they certainly can, and I'm not advocating any method um, over the other, um, uh, but I'm simply saying we need to report why we're using it. And what I've found is, you know, those reasons why we've used inverse distance simply aren't being reported. Um, so I guess uh, that's part of the reason um, you know, we got together um, in this forum is to, you know, not just share my own opinions, um, which I'm sure everyone is uh, sick of listening to by now. Um, so I wanted to put a few questions up to um, the, the panel members, um, you know, um, my peers, and, and even to people who might be listening in. Um, that might want to address some of these questions, um, or maybe they just have some more general comments, um, something to add, feel free um, to put those in the, in the comments box or even shoot us um, an email after the forum. I'm happy to I think we might have- uh... Jump in maybe, oh, yeah. maybe you'd like to, um, um, take the reins and pick a couple of these questions and 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 go for it. And thanks, Kane. Thanks for that update. Um, just before we get on to those questions, I, I have oh. one question to um, I, I guess to tease out some of the um, summary that you've put together, and that is: um, is there a difference between, say, um, advanced projects or um, yeah, I guess, I guess operating companies versus exploring companies in terms of how they report. Um, do they, do they, do they, does one use IDW and, and the others use something different or was that not? No, uh, what I found is no matter what size the company, they're all using um, IDW or inverse distance. Um, again, I, I don't want to jump in and, and put, um, you know, uh, take anybody else's thunder or um, again, these are my own opinions, but um, Inverse distance weighting um, is is fine to use um, as an algorithm, and in fact, when there's less than say 50 data points, then you can't really construct meaningful variograms. So, you know, perhaps geostatistical methods um, 
on limited data sets isn't warranted. Um, and when you have a small exploration player who, who hasn't drilled that many holes, then, you know, a simple methodology um, and may actually be fine. Um, what I've just found is that uh, despite what they're using, um, there's just no reasoning behind what we, why they've used the method. A simple statement um, saying uh, used inverse distance um, because there were, you know, 20 data points available, uh, meaning a full areogram couldn't be constructed, so, uh, you know, didn't bother. Or even uh, more transparency around, um, you know, why if they didn't have access to geostatistical methods or tools, you can just state that and say, you know, I didn't have access to it, I used inverse distance or, or whatever. Um, some, some more robust reasoning behind it. Um, or again, I compared a few different algorithms and inverse distance weighting uh, was comparable to those other algorithms, so I didn't, couldn't be bothered going through the complicated um, process of area modeling. Any of those sort of reasons, I think, from my mind would be would be okay and robust enough and transparent enough. Um, but what I found is that no matter the size of the company, um, it's more of a statement that I've used inverse distance weighting, the end. I've used triangulation for modeling coal surfaces, the end. And, and, and that's sort of um, one of my main kind of bugbears and something that I wanted to bring up um, just just uh, you know to the forum and 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 <laughs> basically get other people's opinions on what they've seen in the reporting as well. Fair enough, thanks Kane. Um, well how about we begin to these questions uh, and uh, let's start with um, I, I guess uh, probably the two in, in the largest companies there, um, Emma and, and Noel. Uh, one being uh, purely coal and the other one being a company that has coal and, and, and base metals as well. Um, what methods are your go-tos for uh, modelling and uh, why? Uh, Emma? Um, okay, I guess uh, we use Vulcan software and, and in that software we mostly use um, uh, triangulation and inverse distance for structural modeling and for coal quality modeling, we mostly use uh, inverse distance. Um, sometimes um, our coal quality uh, will use uh, creeping as well for constructing grids. Um, I guess there's a, a number of reasons why we, we, we've continued to use it. Um, simplicity, especially for, like, as, as Kane mentioned, multi-seam um, deposits. Um, and um, lack of knowledge or expertise on alternatives as well. Just, uh, I guess that's what we were, I was shown at the time and that's what we've continued to use. Um, even, you know, it goes so far as software training documents actually uh, recommend to use certain techniques. Um, uh, and, and also, as, as Kay mentioned, kind of reliance on historical results in that if we're changing our modeling method, that's gonna change our resource estimate. Um, and then having to explain whether it's positive or negative, explain that away. Um, but that's all, that's all part of the process. It, that might be something we just have, have to do. Um, what else? Um, I guess I haven't gone down the path too much of trialing. I have done exact comparisons with trialing um, other um, methods, but I have seen the same data displayed um, with a couple of the other techniques. And I do, do think it looks a little bit more natural um, because often it's more smooth than what the inverse distance technique is. However, I do, um, without going into detail about you know, an exact comparison, whether that smoothing then uh, takes out some of the detail that we that you might have in, in that modelling. Thanks, Emma. Uh, Noel, uh, yourself with PHP, given uh, a company that works in both metals and coal, is there a preference? Thanks for the questions. So I'll go through one by one. And in the current capacity, I am not the CP for resource estimations or resource reporting, but I did that in the past. Uh, my main responsibility or work and dealing with this called quality 
modeling or um, special estimation in regards with quality is more to just like productions or day-to-day -day mind geology kind of you know activities which is uh, quite important for us to verify what we explore what we model and what is there in the ground so that's probably my perspective on my point of view so in regards with the methods that I'm currently using so we use a bit of both, so it's really fit for proposed kind of approach. So if we happen to deal with complicated areas where irregular um, quality attributes that we need to uh, model, then we look at the, um, the creaking. But in most of the cases, if it's simple, if it's not so many um, variability, and then we use the um, uh, inverse distance. So that's probably uh, question number one. The second is why we still use inverse distance. Well, um, for me, I mean, I've been in the, uh, what do you call it, explorations, greenfield, brownfield. Sometimes we start using, or sometimes we only have a very limited data. And then in most of the cases, we don't have, um, you know, um, the luxury to have more than 30 boreholes. So then we start with the um, uh, um, inverse distance because we cannot uh, generate variogram if the data only you know less than 30 or something like that so that's probably the main reasons we're looking at the data we're looking at wh whether it is uniformly distributed or not what is the density of the data what is the um, local anomalies if we can see it so all of those things is really the driver when um, we start looking at inverse distance. I guess in this um, forum, we're only looking at algorithm. But in my point of view, limited experience probably in the other software other than Mindscape or Vulkan, there are other three or four things that we uh, really need to look at as well. And then it drives the outcome of the spatial estimation or spatial interpolation, if I can use um, Kane's um, words, which is the, um, uh, what do you call it, the, um, the data itself, uh, number of data points, search area, what is the grids that we are looking at here, um, the targets, whether it is big, small, or things like that, and algorithms. So all of those four or five different uh, parameters or criteria will drive what will be the outcome looks like. And why I think this um, inverse distance remains so prevalent, I just want to add the things that Emma already uh, mentioned. I just want to stress out, and I think I saw a comment from Ian Wolf as well. Um, one of the things that I saw is in the past, management is sometimes not so very supportive in using Krigging or just that method, maybe because it is more difficult to understand uh, or new to, to them, so something like that. Um, other things that probably I can add to that is I think sometimes people want to do a um, just bit of test what the data looks like and what is the you know spatial estimation or interpolation looks like and then they start with the um, um, in first distance and then after oh I'm happy with this and they didn't what do you call it look back to the uh, what do you call it the uh, what do you call it the um, other um, algorithm um, also just like very um, short times required to develop in first distance kind of estimations and yeah i just want to touch uh, probably in the past when uh, we start using this uh, creaking back in early 2000s it is not so many people trained to utilize the um the algorithm but i don't think it is the right reasons for um yeah for today so i think it is more and more easier we get the um, training or exposure to Krigging. So that's probably um, another thing. And the next question is try and compare in first distance against other methods. Yes, um, I personally did one. And conclusion is, I think, again, fit for purpose. I just keep repeating this one because before you decide what is the algorithm, normally what we did is looking at the data first what is the data stationary looks like? You run the descriptive uh, stats. You look at the histogram. Is it unimodal or bimodal? What does it look like? There's a lot of faults. What is the irregularity of the data? What is the um, data distribution looks like? It is lined, it is grids, it is clustered into one or two different areas and things like that. All of those three or four criteria or parameters, um, so after we're looking 
uh, on those exploration data analysis, then we go to the algorithm, which one is better compared to the other. Better doesn't mean it is um, better in regards with the accuracy and things like that, but also we looking at um, timing, um, what is really the purpose of this estimation and things like that. Um, the last one, do you see future where alternative methods are more prevalent? Uh, or do you think I, WI will remain status quo? I don't see it as a status quo or prevalent or anything. Again, uh, it is a fit for purpose. We have these tools. Um, we have in first distance, we have frigging, we have other methods that Ken already mentioned. The most important thing for me is to start looking at the data, doing ADA first, exploration data analysis, what does it look like, and choose what is the best one. Have someone to peer review our um, works, our outcome, and yeah, so that's probably uh, my limited experience in dealing with this special interpolation or estimation. Thanks, Noel. You've, you've, you've faltered ahead there, but that's okay. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, both Ian and Peter, being in um, consultancies uh, when you're dealing with a lot of clients, uh, maybe start with you, Ian, first, and then on to Peter. Um, is, it, is it something that you recommend to them, the method, or is it something that they come to you and say, I want IDW or um, similar? Um, I think we, we, we wouldn't recommend it or they don't, they don't come to us. It's just sort of, it is what it is. That's what we use. Um, and I think it's the, I think it provides a really good answer overall. It's a great sort of representation of the data set. Sometimes we get really, really large uh, data sets, but uh, working with some of the juniors, they kind of, they can be limited with their data sets as well. Um, so, you know, when they're limited in data sets, we can't use those creaking sort of uh, methodologies. Um, but I think, you know, overall it provides a really useful answer and interpretation um, that people can sort of get an understanding of um, fairly quickly. I mean, some of our clients, they might be in the mining industry, but they don't have a mining background. Um, so they want to be sort of able to get an understanding as quickly as possible. And I think it sounds a bit weird, but you know, in this distance provides a sort of layman's term sort of answer to some of their, some of their projects. And uh, Peter? Um, I mean, the majority of these um, coal deposits that we're looking at, are, they're quite large, I suppose is a <laughs> understatement. Um, and majority of where the exploration is undertaken is in the first five to 10 years of where the mine is. So majority of the boreholes tend to be a long strike. So you've got straight away that, um, that offset of data density being, you know, where you're mining currently, but where we're looking in resource reserve reporting is very sparse, like 500 metre spacing core holes that, you know, and if you're talking 10 metre seams, 100 mil um, diameter core, it's very sparse data. So the benefits that you find in using um, Krigging versus inverse distance, I find isn't really there. Um, I mean, when we do inverse distance modeling, it's not just the one algorithm that we run. So there's a few different, a few different techniques that we like to apply. So the first one is you're changing your power. So when you change your power <clears throat> in your inverse distance method, you're changing how the model reacts. So as you increase the power, it's um, the average that you receive back in your model is very um, bullseye, you know, so very, located around your data points whereas when you lower that power you get a more of an average look to your model which is generally what you're chasing you know um, so i think it's not just oh we're using inverse distance or we're using krigging there's there's other little subtle techniques that we've tried over the years that um have refined those processes so that the outcome that you get um is more realistic um, the other thing to consider is a lot of these mines are multi steam multi-product. So you're looking at hundreds of grids that we're producing. And in the past, we have um, sat there and done all the geostatistical analysis and variograms, and you're just spending months and months doing this. And at the end of the day, the, um, the mining engineers are banging on the door saying, where's the model? We need to, to run our reserve estimate. We need to do our life of mine planning. So. 
Um, it's just not feasible to do complicated studies on every variable. And it's always good to blame the engineer like that. Um, <laughs> that um, Kane, uh, in your experience, both now as a consultant and also, I, I guess, uh, previously with Peabody and others, have you run multiple different models? And um, I might be showing my um, coal mining ignorance here, but certainly in metalliferous mines, uh, mines have their um, grade control model or their, their, their localised mining models. Um, do coal mines have similar and, and do they compare well? Um, I have compared many, many different methods um, previously. Um, I think uh, Noel probably um, hit the nail on the head when he said it's really dependent on the resolution of your data, your sample distribution, and a whole host of other factors for what method should be preferred potentially over another. Um, but what I've um, also found is that there's a there's probably a lack of um, cross validation that's being conducted. So you can actually cross validate all of these different models um, um, and determine which one might be more accurate or have a lower error or whatever it might be. And that's something that's not usually conducted. Um, I kind of uh, have evaluated a, a lot of different um, deposits and a lot of different uh, methods and compared a lot of different methods, but it's not something that's so um, so common. Um, and I found that, yeah, it's like Noel said, very dependent on the data itself, the distribution of the data, which method works over another. Um, and I guess I'm not advocating, again, for a specific method, um, probably more so just to have um, a bit more robust reasoning over why we're using a method and all these things that Noel, uh, well, everyone has said actually are valid reasons for why you might want to use inverse distance or another methodology for a deposit. Um, but for whatever reason, we're just not reporting those reasons. And I think for transparency, and especially in JORC reports, we need to just be listing out some of those reasons so people understand, look, we, we are doing these things or we do understand that it's dependent on the data, it's dependent on a whole host of different factors um, why we're using a certain method. Um, just simply stating those reasons, I think, um, is really important um, and, and should be something that we should be uh, striving to do in all of our um, JORC resource reports. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, it's something um, the ASX probably needs to do a little bit more work on following people up. Um, I'm not sure who the best person to answer this question is, but um, is there a difference with metallurgical coal and thermal coal? And um, does one method work better than others? Or is it, again, goes back to the amount of data we have? Yeah, I'd say just the amount of data you have, you know. Um, generally, they're drilled on you know, your drill hole spacing analysis is where your, you know, your more detailed geostatistical methods come in. Um, and using that, we determine, you know, the spatial variability and what we need to drill. But generally, your 250 metre centres is the closest you're going to get for resources. Um, that's not to say for your, for your short term mine day to day, you wouldn't drill closer in a grey control program. But, um, but generally, the distance between your coking and or metallurgical and thermal coal, um, it's not really a driver on which modelling method to use, so to speak. Fair enough. Okay, thank you. Um, Emma, uh, you've been quiet for a little while. I'll, I'll pick on you for now. Um, do you see a future where there's different methods or is IDW going to be the long-term winner? Um, I think uh, alternative methods will, come, will creep in over time, but um, because I think everyone's so ingrained with the inverse distance, um, it, you just, it might be just additional documentation or justification or education to back up what you're doing um, to, to, to just, justify to your peers 
um, due to, I guess, the inverse distance being so ingrained. But um, as the others have, have said, it's, um, it's really dependent on what your data set is, whether inverse distance is still okay, or whether you've got a, a lot of extra data and you can go down the, the creaking method or whatever, whatever is appropriate. Uh, thanks, Emma. Uh, there's a few questions coming in from the floor and I encourage others, if they've got some questions now, is the time to uh, um, type them in there. Um, and just a reminder, please use the Q&A function over the, rather than the chat. Um, just makes it a little bit easier. And others can actually vote for those uh, questions as well so we can make sure they get answered. Um, the first question here is from uh, Phil Dangerfield. With the changes in the JORC guidelines around distances from structural and coal quality drill holes, have you noted any companies updating resource estimates based on this modifying factor rather than based on additional geological information through drilling? Um, Noel, would you like to have a stab at that one? Sorry, which one is that? I just uh, lost the last bit, sorry. Uh, this is a question from Phil Dangerfield, the very first question on the Q&A list there, um, around the changes to the draw guideline and distances. Yeah, probably I cannot answer that question because currently I'm not doing any CP report or anything. Um, you know, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no worries. Uh, who would like to uh, tackle that one? Ian? Uh, yeah, from my personal experience, no, I haven't seen sort of um, uh, anyone doing it this way. I'm just, hold on, I'm reading the question again. Sorry, apologies. Um, Uh, yeah, no, I can't say I've, I've noticed anything um, being updated on modifying factors. Um, I think I think we've we're still using the geological information through drilling. I think the the points of observations require sort of um, you know the drilling to to provide the, that information. You know the, the coal quality uh, analysis and, and, and geophysics as well. So. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I can't see anyone else. Well, I've never personally come across it, I should say. Okay, thanks, Ian. Um, there's a couple from, uh, well, a question from David Green. Uh, do different methods apply better to different parameters, especially quality? Please give examples. Um, I think we've uh, kind of answered that one. Um, has anyone got any more to extend on that? Uh, I can probably add a little bit. Um, Dave's probably alluding to things like um, trending in some variables. So for, you know, like rank or um, or vols, for instance, as you get deeper, you know, there's a depositional effect to the coal where your rank will increase and your things like vols will, will um, uh, decrease as well. So um, so generally, it's not so much the algorithm, but it's more the trending that we apply to situations like that. Um, yeah, so it's not just use the method and get the result. Like there's a lot of subtleties, there's smoothing, there's the grid cell size that we use, there's the weighting um, in, when we're doing these models that we consider. Um, hope that helps. Yeah, I can add a little bit as well, Pete. Um, yeah, not that I can see. I mean, I'm working in few of the, um, what do you call it, large mines, and then, you know, looking at, say, for example, vaults or um, rank and things like that, and use a different techniques or methods and see whether it is significantly different. I think I can confirm what you said, Pete. It is probably not really a huge different but i'm more concerned on the um data density and distributions i mean give an example just like the yam cooking properties probably not as uh, many as our proxy for example so then when we um uh grids uh cooking properties because the data is less compared to the other one so then we might have to do something different or something so that's more to the data distribution density Oh, thanks, Noel. Uh, question from uh, Cheryl Holtz. 
My experience has been with Minix software. Minix has Kreeing, IDW, and also growth techniques. I know that Anglo-American and Yankol are using the software and depending on the spatial distribution of data at each deposit use, uh, what it, uh, depending on the data of each deposit use, what is felt to be an appropriate methodology, which is not always IDW. It's interesting uh, that your study found that the main software packages used, uh, Mindscape and Vulkan, was there any evidence of other software programs that use different methods from your study? I guess it was on skewer for you, Kane. Uh, yeah, there were a few other um, software packages which popped up in the study. Um, again, there, I think there's a, a, um, a table in the appendix or a table in the paper that mentions um, Minix. Um, so there was a few um, packages, but uh, I think uh, overwhelmingly um, it was um, uh, Vulkan and Mindscape um, were the two um, top Meth, uh, sorry, modeling programs which were used. Um, in X one, there was somebody who used Leapfrog for a portion of their um, modeling work. Um, but <laughs> interestingly, some of those uh, companies that you mentioned um, haven't been reporting um, results to the ASX, probably because of the materiality of their um, of their uh, resources to to the overall um, company structure. Um, so, you know, that there are some pitfalls in the study in that it's not um, going to be representative of every single um, entity, um, coal mining entity in Australia. Um, you know, some, some don't report all of their results. Uh, there's a lot of small exploration players who might not be listed. Um, so they might be using um, uh, software which um, isn't as expensive as some of these. So we might be missing out on some of those um, uh, software um, applications which are being used by small players. Um, so, you know, there is a bit of a bias uh, in the study, which, which I'll admit. Um, but yeah, Minix, uh, to cut a long story short, was one of the um, programs, but it did list, uh, I think, if I go back to the appendix, um, um, they used inverse distance for their uh, coal quality property modeling in that, in that instance anyway. Uh, thanks, Kane. And while you're there, the next question probably uh, works for you as well, uh, from Ian Wolf. Um, do the JORC reports submitted to the ASX include maps on structural con uh, structure contours, isopacks of coal quality, etc., along a geological story of each factor, or do they simply skip the resource uh, skip to the resource reserve number? Uh, yeah, I, I would probably say there's varying quality on the amount of information that's included in. Um, the JORC reports, which are submitted to the ASX, there's, everyone is supposed to submit table one, which outlines a whole host of um, uh, things, including cross sections and contours and bits and pieces that you're supposed to put in these table ones. Um, some companies actually also include uh, like a, a geological report at the front end of um, the table one. Um, and some people just use, some companies just use the table um, uh, one structure to fill out their um, details of their resource estimation. Um, so again, there's varying qualities. Um, some do include um, structural contours, um, ice packs, all that sort of stuff, cross sections. Um, and, and, you know, they shouldn't, according to the guidelines, they, they shouldn't just be reporting the numbers and they should be doing all these, um, these things. Uh, thanks, Kane. Uh, next question from Phil Dangerfield. Uh, would using Kreeging then also provide a basis for using the KV, SOR, etc., as a basis for the resource classification? Would that be too scary for the industry? Who'd like to tackle that one? Um, I probably assume we're talking about Kreeging variants um, and, and basically the um, the estimation of error that comes along with unusing the Krieging methodology. Um, so, you know, one of the primary advantages of Krieging and some other hybrid techniques is that they provide um, not only the predicted value, but an estimated, um, uh, an estimation of uh, the error of that predicted value. And there are techniques to use that error estimate 
to drive your resource classification. And there's been quite a few papers um, um, sort of uh, outlining methods to do that. And um, interestingly, a lot of people actually use uh, variograms and potentially Kriegian variants to drive their resource classifications, but then use inverse distance to actually model the whole quality parameters. So there's also a little bit of a disparity and mismatch there when that happens, which is another kind of interesting topic. Um, but yeah, uh, definitely um, using Kriging um, and the variograms that you construct to, to go into those, um, to go into the Kriging um, can be used for a dual hole spacing analysis or a Kriging variance type um, analysis to help inform the resource classification. Thanks, Kate. Um, so to, uh, I guess, extend a little bit on that about uh, too scary for the industry, but also um, for the markets, I guess my experience in, in, in gold is that most investors are not particularly sophisticated. Um, let's just call them punters rather than investors. Um, and they will believe any number they're given. So does it really matter what method it is that you present to the market rather than what's fit for purpose for mining? Maybe start with you, Emma, on this one. You've been uh, quiet there for a while. Um, I guess we, we actually been uh, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. We don't report to the ASX, so it's pretty rare for us to have to do a job report. Um, uh, sorry, what were you saying? The so it, it, yeah, when we're reporting, regardless of yep. people reporting to, um, given yeah. that most uh, investors have no idea what the number means anyway, and they're just told by um, someone this is good, bad, or indifferent. Um, does it matter what what you do for the investors? Is it more important to make sure that your models are correct and fit for purpose for your mining? Uh, I think, yes, for mining, for sure, because, well, you still need to be able to justify to your peers that you've done, you've gotten the best result you can out of the data. So you're kind of there to, to do that rather than to make it look pretty for investors if it comes down to your, um, I guess, your comp competency of, of doing, your, doing your work. Yeah, um, thanks, Emma. And has anyone actually come across cases where the models have been that wildly out that um, where they haven't used IDW that they've been scared off it and, and gone back to IDW? Maybe, uh, um, yeah, I guess some of the, it depends on the variability of the data that you're looking at. So some of our variables like, um, Phosphorus, for instance, you'll drill one hole and it'll be world apart from a hole drilled right next to it just because of the, the nature of the, um, of the variable itself and the formation of phosphorus within the coal. Um, so a lot of the times you can't use a variogram because you just can't, it's just sore to. So in those instances, using the global average gives a better representation of what's in the ground um, anyway. So yeah, I mean, we've in the past I've been part of studies where we've looked at that and um, was yeah, afraid to use Krigging because it was just a too skewed of a result. So we just went back to the um, inverse distance in that instance. Uh, thanks, Peter. Um, Ian de Klerk asks, how much better is the G to I can't even say it today. Uh, that's estimate in terms of error variance than IDW estimate. Um, is the increase work required worth it? Uh, maybe you, Ian. Um, that might be a bit beyond my sort of uh, understanding. I mean, I, I, I've <coughs> predominantly done all my coal resource estimates and uh, using IDW. So um, certainly, I mean, IDW is quick and efficient. Um, we, we spoke about, you know, the Kriging, it takes a little bit more sort of grunt work and certainly a lot more knowledge. Um, and because you're picking that variogram <clears throat> yourself, I mean, it's there's probably a little bit of bias in there that might cause some some areas errors or, or variances to 
to, to creep through. Um, but I think, yeah, that's about as much knowledge as I have on that, unless someone else wants to fill in the blanks for me there. Um, I can jump in. There's a few comments there around whether uh, uh, there's a material difference between in the actual resource estimate itself between using these methods. You know, if one is, you know, uh, whatever error percent better than the other, does it actually make a material difference to your overall resource estimate? And does it make a material difference to your resource classification? And um, I could probably say, watch your space. I'm doing a bit of uh, work in the background on on, a, on um, addressing some of those questions. Um, but the short answer is uh, sometimes yes, and sometimes no. Again, um, if you have a, I would probably say if you've got a complicated um, deposit um, with heaps of cluster data and and all sorts of things going on, um, it might be worth um, trying different techniques and comparing, cross-validating those different techniques. Uh, maybe even using more advanced techniques, which can make use of additional auxiliary variables, like we've got um, heaps of uh, wireline logs, which are known, you know, density is known to be correlated with ash, and they can be used as auxiliary variables to potentially improve estimates and that sort of thing. Um, but mainly that's in uh, data-rich deposits. So I think if you've got a reasonably data-rich deposit, um, it could make a, a, a difference in the um, resource estimation, um, the actual overall resource estimate, um, or probably more importantly, it could mean that you can just drill less holes, um, which I mean, it's correlated to the confidence of the resource. But if you've got a robust model that uses, say, um, some auxiliary information from um, chip holes, some wireline logs, and that gives you confidence that you don't have to go and uh, drill quality holes at 200 centers, then you know that's probably our win from a, you know, both a resource and a, and a, and a cost perspective for a company. Excellent, thanks, Kane. Um, I think- Can I add on that one, Peter, just a little bit? Yeah, go for it. I, think, I, I don't want to go into detail, but from what I experienced uh, comparing between the two and whether there is a significant uh, difference or not between the cross-validations, I think um, the, 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 the creaking is not that um, you know, uh, uh, significantly different or inverse distance is not uh, less or not, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, sorry, creaking is not better than in, in first distance when we have less than um, 30 data points. So I think I already mentioned it uh, before. And also the outlier. So when you do in the, um, uh, what do you call it? Descriptive statistic, you see the outliers with anomalous um, data point, the values, uh, those outlier values, I think, need to be addressed first or removed first, or you need to do uh, something about it before you continue. And the other one that I dealt in the past is a large uh, data set, but we have local unexplained kind of um, error or nugget. So that's also, um, yeah, struggling when we did the, um, the, the triggering. Also, last but not least, is the um, low, um, uh, not sample recovery, sorry. It is about the um, sample from mixed uh, different proportion of population, sorry. So say, for example, um, can touch about the um, uh, wireline logging. So when we look at wireline logging, we try to um, uh, make sense of what's happening. Um, this deposits has been like, you know, 50, 40 years, numerous amounts of contractors and different sets of tools and everything. So if we deal with a mix of um, uh, population, yeah, that's where um, frigging is probably start to, you know, struggling and yeah, so that's probably some other comment. Okay, thanks, uh, Noel. Um, we're coming to uh, end of time now, so um, I'd just like to wrap this up with uh, asking you all for your final parting thoughts and uh, words of wisdom um, and in no particular order, I'll start uh, with uh, Peter. Sure. Um, in my opinion, I think there's a place for both triggering and inverse distance. Um, obviously, as alluded to by the other panelists, when you've got more data, it makes um, a lot more sense to use something that's going to decluster your data. That's going to um, get rid of redundancy in, in too many data points and give you a better estimate. Um, but there are times when you haven't got that data, when you're 
sparsely spaced, where using creaking over inverse distance is um, is going to be the similar, you know, similar result in both cases. So um, that's why the majority of the time inverse distance is used, just because it's a lot faster and you can um, get the results a lot quicker and efficiently for the same um, potential benefits for both. Thanks, Peter. Noel, yourself, final thoughts? Uh, I guess I keep uh, repeating this, fit for purpose, looking at your target, what is the size of, um, what do you call it, area you are going to estimate, is it regional or local, continuity, um, and then, you know, what is the grid size, search area, is it small or big, or what is the orientation, your weighting, your shape, it is circular or um, elliptical, and number of data points. So yeah, based on those um, informations or data, you do your exploration data analysis and decide what is the best algorithm for you. Thanks, Noel. And uh, Ian? Yeah, I guess, I mean, <laughs> overall, it's, uh, it's a, it's a solid, solid methodology to use at the moment. I mean, it provides a very cost-effective and efficient sort of answer for our clients and um, some of them don't have big budgets to spend on large statistical studies. So, um, you know, it gives us a, a very, very good understanding on, you know, multi-seam deposits and yeah. Thanks Ian. Emma? Uh, just as the others have said, I guess having a fit for purpose model, um, certainly in, in the Varies uh, the variable of cost settings that I see that um, we I have to mix and match uh, different techniques to um, to get the the right outcome. So um, yeah, just I guess expanding um, our view and uh, yeah, just seeing anything that's fit for, for purpose. Uh, thanks, Emma and uh, Kane. Final thoughts. Yep, I'll just say that. You know, when you do find that fit for purpose um, methodology or method um, and all the work that you've been, you put into finding that method, actually write it down and put it in the JORC report and say, you know, we did exploratory data analysis and we determined that, you know, uh, this algorithm was fit for purpose because of these reasons. Um, just a bit more transparency, that's all. Well, thank you, Kane. Um, well, it's been a pleasure to um, host uh, today's uh, discussion, um, and the AIG would like to thank um, all involved, Kane, Emma, Peter, Ian, and all. Um, special thanks to Kane for getting this all together and, and hurting everyone together. Um, and I hope that uh, we are trying to get someone in the coal industry to get up and give us a talk, a technical talk next year. So uh, if anyone's interested, please drop me a line, either through LinkedIn or uh, through the AIG website, just to the Queensland branch, and uh, we'll see if we can organise a talk for everyone as well. Um, and in the meantime, uh, see you all hopefully on the 8th of September for the AIG ALS technical talk um, on Missima Gold. Thank you all, and good evening.